Thank you, Marie, and uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, good afternoon or good morning to those further afield. Uh, so, my, as Marie said, my name is Mike Burton, and I've got half an hour to talk to you, and then hopefully uh, some much more time to listen to you uh, uh, and uh, answer, try to answer some of the questions you may have about what we're doing in England to uh, respond to both reports from uh, Robert Francis and uh, John Berwick. So I'd like to just set out uh, a frame for, for this evening, just to, to give us this opportunity to reflect on what Don uh, had said following uh, Robert Francis's uh, very insightful two reports into care at Midstaff, and then start to see how that in itself has started to help us deliver a, an appropriate strategy for patient safety for the NHS in England. And also then to give you uh, a heads up uh, on some of the initiatives that we're introducing, which I hope will be a huge impact for our patients, first of all, for the organizations within which we all work, uh, for our whole system, uh, but equally balanced as much for our patients as for ourselves as clinicians, uh, uh, as we strive to improve uh, that conversation and uh, that listening opportunity we have with our patients to understand exactly what their needs are. Uh, uh, as you see, we've set out a few goals that we think will be important, and I hope that I match up uh, to those aspirations. And please keep feeding back during uh, during this uh, webinar. So, to um, just to set the scene, then, so Robert Francis produced a report uh, in February 2013, which was published. It was taken then up by the government, uh, uh, and who then produced a response to it. At the time of the uh, government's response, the Prime Minister announced two elements uh, uh, further inquiry that he wanted to be put in place. The first was to ask Sir Bruce Keogh to look at uh, a number of trusts, 14 trusts, who had struggled to uh, achieve uh, a, uh, a HSMR and Shimmy uh, for uh, where they were demonstrating they had, they had a higher than expected uh, avoidable death rate at their hospitals. The second uh, charge from the Prime Minister was to ask Professor Don Berwick of uh, IHI in Boston uh, to look at how he would set out a frame to improve the safety of patients uh, in England. And we then helped Don put together an advisory group who, who were um, uh, from across the UK uh, and uh, North America, but also we interviewed many uh, from across the world uh, as well as from other elements of, of uh, the system uh, in the UK. The government then responded uh, to Robert Francis' report last year, this time last year, and a key as aspect of that report, both in terms of building on Don's work and the work that we had started, was to, to do everything we possibly can in a positive way to make uh, the NHS the safest healthcare system in the world. Uh, and I hope that we are on that journey. So from Don's perspective, what was he what was he looking at? Well, he, he believed that the most important single change uh, in the, the NHS to respond uh, to the Francis uh, inquiry would be for it, and that means us, to become more than ever uh, a system devoted to continual learning and improvement of patient care. Uh, top to bottom, as he said, and end to end. Uh, but within that frame, the most important recommendations for everything will be to envisage in the NHS as a learning organisation, uh, learning and fully committed to placing the quality of patient care above all aims, particularly safety, uh, to engage, empower and hear our patients and carers through the entire system. Uh, and in my words, that's in every sector and every setting. To really, really put wholeheartedly the growth and development of all our staff uh, at the core, including their ability to, to support, to improve the processes in which they work. So a key message is to be able to go to work to do your job, but also be given the opportunity and the, and the tools to be able to go to work to improve how you do your job. And probably as a, as a most important and long-lasting change, we're now starting to see across a number of different avenues, to embrace transparency unequivocally and everywhere uh, uh, in the service of accountability, trust, uh, and the growth of knowledge. Knowledge 
for ourselves uh, as clinicians and, and workers in healthcare, and for knowledge for our patients, uh, to remind ourselves that always we're doing everything for our patients. They must be at the centre, not only of what we, when we listen to them um, in our minds, but also at the centre of that, that uh, owning of knowledge. So, uh, the next couple of slides, we'll just go through some of, um, can I just go back point? Oh, yeah, okay. We go through um, some of Don's solutions. Uh, now, he put together a group, um, an advisory board, and he would say himself that every single element of the advisory uh, mechanism was coming through. All the outputs from that group came from the group, not from him. Uh, but those of you who have read his work on, and have met him will understand and, and recognize some of the language some of the style and vision uh, that he sits. So, so it is a group, it was a group work, but very much had gone at the heart of it. So to recognize with clarity and courage for wide systemic change uh, at, in every sector, in every setting. Uh, forget blame, it's, a, it's a, of no use in, uh, to us at all, it should be abandoned. Uh, and we should always trust the goodwill and intentions of our staff to help them achieve what they already want to achieve. We should reassert absolutely the primacy of working with patients and carers to set and achieve their health care goals. Uh, I'm doing this just uh, an industry for the whole report by basically the goals, but these can be come out strikingly. We must, we must use quantitative goals with caution. Uh, they have an important role en route to progress, but should never be replaced, displaced the primary goal of better care. Uh, hence this adherence to, uh, to quantitative goals and standards. Uh, uh, at the, uh, the loss of the primacy of the, the patient uh, within that dynamic. To recognize that transparency is essential uh, and expect an insistence on, on it at all levels and with regard to all types of information uh, that are relevant to our patients' particular journey, wherever they are on that journey. Our patients own the data about themselves, not we don't own it, we're just privileged to be able to support them and use that data. We should ensure that the responsibility for functions related to safety improvement are vested clearly and simply. This was because he believes and the group concurred that there was a, uh, a gap in uh, the system. This has come out more recently. Uh, there was a, uh, not a clear uh, signaling of, of where commissioning, regulation, improvement, uh, and delivery with regard to safety uh, sat. If the people of the NHS, that's ourselves, the staff of the NHS, uh, career long help to learn, master, and apply modern methods for quality control, improvement, and planning. Uh, the work that was signaled by Codman in the 40s and 50s um, in terms of how he, he lent and supported lead production methodology. Uh, the work of Avedis Donabadian in terms of structure, process, uh, and outcome as being the core uh, that was taken on later by. The, Julio Frank in Mexico and now uh, in his work at, in Harvard in terms of ideas into action. And we should most of all bring pride and joy back into our work uh, rather than fear uh, of change. And we should infuse the NHS uh, with that pride and joy. So my commitments in terms of NHS England was to build on those, those two reports from Robert Francis to take at heart what Robert Francis was saying but to build and use the advisory group's recommendations to deliver a new system uh, across England in many sectors and settings. We would relaunch a patient safety alert system. Uh, I'll come on to that later. All of these I'm going to talk a little bit later on. We would uh, absolutely publish detailed patient safety data about patients' uh, experiences uh, as much as possible at every hospital, but more and more increasingly at ward level. Uh, where it is relevant to the individual patients and their family. We would encourage the continuation of NHS safety to monitor data in terms of creating uh, that local momentum around measurement, that local expertise for measurement for improvement, but we'd also extend it and, and, and see whether there are other avenues that we could use that work with. We would be much more open and visible about uh, never event data. We would publish this uh, on a regular basis rather than as a response to FOI, uh, and we'll come on to that. Sorry, freedom of information uh, 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 requests, uh, and we have started to do that, but we'll continue to do that. 
we will establish a new patient safety collaborative program. Now, this is, would be a set of learning networks across England. We will align patient safety measurement uh, with the other elements of the system. So this credibility gap, if you like, about who would lead the safety. Uh, so we would have a common book, single version of the truth with regard to safety measurement between the CQC, the delivery system, uh, and the commissioning system. And we would launch a patient safety improvement fellowship, of which I'm really excited about to talk to you later on. And we would consistently and effectively work across organizations. <clears throat> we'll be sharing these slides with you uh, uh, after uh, this webinar. So I hope you'll forgive me if I, if I don't spend too long uh, on this, but really to call into mind from this that uh, we had a number of different uh, strategic uh, drivers um, in terms of our strategic statutory responsibilities, our mandate. This is our contract with government uh, as the leadership organization in the NHS for uh, to deliver. We have a contract with government to deliver uh, improvement. And we have an outcomes framework uh, uh, within which safety sits as a key domain uh, within the outcomes framework. We believed that uh, there are three elements of change that we needed to build strategy for um, and introduce. And the first of that was to gain a better understanding of what goes wrong in healthcare. And you can see there uh, a number of different elements uh, which uh, we will be introducing, uh, have introduced and will continue to introduce to gain that better understanding, to really understand what it is uh, that goes wrong, why it goes wrong, how can we deal and support change. We certainly need, and we decided to embrace fully uh, the Berwick recommendations about enhancing the capability and capacity of the NHS to deliver patient safety improvement, both at system level uh, through the Crafty Program, at individual level uh, through the Patient Safety Fellowship Program, uh, but also in key, key areas and key vulnerable groups. None more so for me than that transition period from childhood to adolescence to adulthood where we lose the engagement of many, many of our young, uh, uh, young people as they move into adulthood, who carry with them long-term conditions, who carry with them uh, uh, single or multiple issues, who often have, uh, may have learning disabilities on top of concurrent physical problems. The other element is, is we don't spend enough time understanding the safety implications for our frail elderly, uh, as well as our fit elderly. Uh, and so for me, uh, that transition into the latter decades of life is a very key safety, safety zone. Our patients are our best signal. We need to do much more to help support them, be part of that debate uh, uh, about not just their medicine and devices and assistive technologies that they will have in their home in the future, but how are we supporting them, uh, reduce the need to rely on those. And then other groups, uh, which uh, we won't have time to talk about today, but certainly those uh, in care homes uh, are particularly uh, concerned of the needs to support uh, those in custody, both in terms of custody in prison, but also uh, under section by mental health acts or under the guardianship uh, of local authorities in children's care homes. We also have some specific key safety areas and safety priorities around some key elements of change. And these will be familiar to all of you in terms of work with safety thermometer, with pressure ulcers, with medication errors, with falls, uh, with BTE, uh, but increasingly uh, an awareness of sepsis, uh, increasingly an awareness that we, we fail to monitor properly, we fail to recognize deterioration. Uh, often failure to deteriorate, recognize deterioration is seen as a hospital concept and it's seen as a hospital solution. But failure to recognize deterioration in every sector, in every setting, is in key uh, is a key task for us to learn uh, how to resolve uh, in hospital, out of hospital, in home, uh, in different parts of, of our system. And many others there that you'll will be interested to see that we are working with. And I hope that after this webinar you, you get in touch with me, not necessarily on the webinar, but subsequently if you believe you can help in any of these different elements. Of our work. So how do we bring this together as a whole system? Uh, this is an attempt. Um, and, it's, uh, and, it's, and it probably fails at its first, uh, first level in fact because of its complexity. However, if we continue to try to resolve the, the issue about a system devoted to continual learning and improvement, and we see in that central space 
the clinician listening to our patient. They occupy that space. So everything around that key union between our clinician and our patient, everything we do in terms of system and organization has to be to support that, support our clinician, support our patient. So here you can see we've adapted this to recognize our three strategic priorities and then recognize some of the elements of change that we believe we want to do. So I will be coming on to these over the next 10 to 12 minutes. But overarching this is a key driver, a key construct, which we're bringing out in terms of a, a sign up to safety campaign, which continually and remorselessly will introduce techniques and help support change to save 6,000 lives and reduce harm by 50%. The 6,000 lives uh, is not made up, uh, and we'll come on to why we think that's relevant uh, uh, shortly. The governance of our whole system approach is, is, uh, uh, is very clear, um, and it's set out uh, both in terms of uh, at level one and two here, very much the Secretary of State uh, for Health, uh, in conjunction with uh, senior civil servants and senior leaders uh, across NHS England uh, and other. Uh, uh, other, other arms length bodies. A continual process um, um, by weekly meetings for those for the ministers, but a weekly a monthly meeting for what's called the Francis Assurance Board and a monthly meeting of a safer care executive working group. This isn't just to show you what is happening, but it's to demonstrate that this is really uh, at the top of the system uh, that we need to come up with uh, and monitor ways of improving uh, and managing our safety. What is our case for change and how do we realize that we uh, need to uh, uh, do uh, something about it? This, this is the data collected from the National Reporting and Learning System, which demonstrates that the system itself is reporting, uh, has reported over 9 million incidents over the last 10 years, but it continues to report about 1.4 million incidents uh, per year. And this is from, in the name of we'll start with the NHS. It is sector specific, unfortunately, and that it is majority of reports come from the hospital settings uh, and community health settings. Uh, but increasingly, uh, we are gaining a, a, a way into primary care uh, so that we need to understand how we can improve the reporting of harm in primary care. This is reporting not on the basis of seeking, seeking uh, punition uh, or seeking sanction. This is reporting on the basis of learning. Uh, and we can understand, therefore, where to place uh, our energies uh, once we start to understand uh, where we are reporting harm. You'll see here on the little table beside that, uh, that of the order of 10,000 of those 1.4 million reports uh, are of severe harm and death. But increasingly, about 80,000 or 6% uh, are of moderate harm. Uh, the definition of harm in itself is the subject of that ever no, the whole treaties, uh, uh, but we review uh, every severe harm and death that's reported by the NHS uh, uh, in our team. So we align our patient safety measurement uh, from all the provider organizations that report uh, through a common patient safety, safety, safety data set, excuse me, uh, and we share that data. Um, there is no concept anymore that data is held by one or two individual organizations. We share this data across the whole, uh, the whole system. And this is uh, unfettered access for all of those. Um, so those who believe that, that, that uh, it, it's held in, in some secret silo uh, are, are the same. One of the constructs that came out of, that was came into criticism uh, by Robert Francis was the alerting system. The alerting system was where an alert was issued by uh, the MPSA National Patient Safety Agency to the system, and that National Patient Safety that alert was then acknowledged um, by the receiving organisations, uh, but no follow through uh, took place uh, on a consistent basis, uh, and Robert Francis criticised that. So we have designed, designed a new uh, National Patient Safety Alerting System, uh, which we launched uh, earlier this year, and has since produced uh, a number of reports um, uh, and. Uh, it has three stages to it, uh, three alert uh, stages. Uh, the first is a warning, so an emerging risk uh, to organizations that may have been picked up by the NRLS or it may have been picked up uh, by uh, another set of bodies. The second phase.
phase is a resource package, so that as well as uh, an issuing a warning, if there is a resource available to mitigate or eradicate that, that risk, uh, we identify it and we send that out to the second uh, stage alert. And then the third of directive uh, alert, which is an actual requirement, uh, will, which will be governed by the commissioners and the CQC, the action needs to take place. Uh, this is a list of the alerts to date, they're all on the electric website, uh, along with uh, the relevant resource packages where they're, where they're in place. Uh, so as you can see, uh, those were issued over this last, last year or so. Uh, I'd like to spend some time on the patient safety collaboratively. This is going to create a, a, a whole system of learning uh, to improve uh, safety uh, across England. Uh, we identified that uh, uh, a sum of money, £60 million, from the uh, NHS England will be distributed over the next five years, uh, £12 million a year, uh, to be shared by uh, academic health science uh, networks and of which there are 15, covering a population size of 2 to 5 million. Each of these collaboratives will be locally owned and run. The majority of the funding will be devolved to local collaboratives. It's absolutely essential that patients are the core of this learning collaborative, uh, but that if they are locally managed and, and led. We will be bringing in national support uh, for a number of different elements. Um, uh, this is uh, just to demonstrate that uh, we will be learning together, and this is a huge opportunity for us to demonstrate to the rest of the world that not only do you have the largest uh, uh, universal coverage system in the world, but we also have we will have the largest improvement program and taking place across 60 million people. Uh, these are the organisations that are signed up to support uh, and continually help uh, our learning across organisations and between organisations through the collaborative processes. Uh, and we will be remorselessly uh, picking their brains and using uh, their expertise, uh, particularly the BMJ, uh, as I'm in their offices at the moment. Um, we've identified a number of priority areas, and these are priority areas that have come across uh, and out of both reporting systems, uh, but also uh, from uh, vulnerable groups and other sources that we recognize. Uh, all of these uh, priority areas need to be worked on by the local system. The local teams need to come up solutions for safety improvement. But we believe there are two national uh, essentials uh, for learning uh, and support at national level, which we will help deliver. And that's a, a leadership program for safety improvement and a measurement program of strategy for safety improvement. Key to leadership is this is not um, to, although, uh, although important to have leadership at the ward level, at the board level, at a link between the ward and the board, this is leadership for clinicians to help support their difficult conversations with their patients, with each other, uh, to understand why is it sometimes difficult to raise uh, your concerns uh, with your, in your own organization. So true leadership skills development. <clears throat> of particular exciting time, I think, is our 5,000 fellowship program. Uh, we have in the past sent individuals, often uh, very small numbers, to uh, to overseas to learn about safety improvement, notably to the IHI program in Harvard and Boston. Um, uh, but this is not enough, and this was never intended to be enough uh, at scale that we required. So uh, we've put together a program uh, of five, of ensuring that we aim for 5,000 fellows over the next five years. This is going to be the most exciting fellowship opportunity for individuals, not just for safety improvement, but learning about quality improvement. We are lucky enough to have with us uh, to be able to co-produce this with the Health Foundation, which has been enormously helpful uh, over the past decade in, in recognizing the need to improve the capability of an individual. And we're going to be working with them to do this at scale uh, across uh, the whole of England. We also have set out uh, an aspiration, uh, which you saw in the overarching uh, slide, of a sign up to safety uh, campaign to reduce uh, avoidable harm and reduce avoidable death. Um, this is uh, a slide to demonstrate some of the work that has already been started on this. We have now over 120 uh, trusts and organizations signed up this since the launch, uh, which took place uh, in June. Um, Suzette Woodward is a fantastically capable individual who is leading the campaign, and this is the campaign as we've identified as chair uh, by uh, today before. 
more and more important uh, as we talk about our, our data with this, the fact that we share our data with our patients. Uh, earlier this year, we launched a website which is now the uh, most comprehensive website anywhere in the world of safety data at the ward and hospital level, covering a number of different uh, elements, both as opposite indicators, but also comparable indicators uh, on specific elements between organizations, but also a set of non-comparable indicators, which patients can look at, particularly those collected by the safety promoter. Uh, this data is uh, available. Uh, it has live feeds from uh, numerous different sources, uh, all recognized and validated through the uh, information center. Uh, and this is freely available to anyone who looks. Interestingly now, we know that there are as many hospital objectives looking at this website to see if they're near neighbors uh, as there are um, uh, many of our own uh, clinicians. Uh, but this has uh, over a million hits a week uh, by our patients. Uh, we mentioned never events data. Um, and uh, in December 2013, we started to publish uh, quarterly. But now, since April, we're starting to, to cover uh, report these uh, monthly um, uh, so that we can uh, ensure that we're learning specifically of the solutions for never events, but also identifying for our patients that these are still happening. And we need to come up with ways uh, to prevent them from happening, particularly uh, the uh, surgical never events that are often around the time of the operating uh, time. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, two, two elements of retrospective case note review that we'll be introducing to really understand uh, in depth uh, how uh, we go about uh, measuring harm in hospital, measuring avoidable death in hospital. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, this 6,000 number. Uh, the PRISM-1 study, which was carried out by Helen Hogan and Nick Black, or many of you will have read it, identified that 5.2% uh, from that cohort of 1,000 adults were found to have had uh, uh, avoidable factors in their, in their death. And so they believe that uh, that would have equated to 12,000 deaths. The reason for that is that there are about 250,000 deaths per year in hospitals. So 5.2% uh, equated with that. Um, We've just finished uh, some work which will be published very soon. Uh, we've looked at a further cohort, a separate cohort, looking at 2,400 deaths, uh, looking also to determine whether or not that first prison study was valid and whether or not this would help us guide, guide us towards a better method of understanding of all the harm and death in hospital. Uh, and this will be produced very soon, very soon uh, and hopefully uh, through one of the the biggest, the biggest journals in the world, I hope. Uh, to understand avoidability, uh, we also need to be able to understand how we investigate uh, death uh, and harm. Uh, and uh, we have not got and had a particularly uh, a successful way of doing running investigations uh, in the past. And so we're looking to set that out as a key, uh, a key process for those small numbers of investigations that, that need uh, active involvement. When the CQC go and inspect, when they look at their intensive, uh, their intelligent monitoring tool uh, across the hospitals in England, they often identify hospitals that need improvement. Um, uh, and those hospitals often are placed in special markets. We believe this, uh, uh, as an adjunct to that is to develop a, an intensive support team, uh, particularly for safety improvement, uh, where safety improvement is seen uh, as uh, the element of most at risk. And um, we are building uh, a safety improvement team, a safety action force for England, uh, which will start its pilot work uh, in January uh, with, and will have identified trusts and hope that trusts will ask for help uh, as well as be identified. And we hope to start that pilot uh, over the three or four months following, uh, following Christmas. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I would ask if you could, if you have time, to read the on the web the Surgical Never Events Task Force. This is a task force was ably led by Suzanne Shale, an ethicist, who looked and, and that group came together and built on three themes by which we could try and reduce surgical never events, standardization, education, and harmonization of practice. Um, and most of, important of all uh, was the need to produce a standard operating procedure uh, for care in hospitals, 
prepared of his own standard operating procedure that was owned locally, uh, but was set against the national uh, set of standards. We've also launched the next generation of safety thermometers, um, not just looking now uh, at pressure ulcers, falls, after associated infections and, and DTE, but now looking at some of those other risk areas that we believe uh, uh, require support, need further support, and more so the uh, maternal health and care, mental health services, uh, children's care, and, and medication safety. Uh, and we launched earlier this week uh, that suite uh, of, of systems that will be available freely through the NHS safety technology. And as you can see, uh, consistently using the classic safety thermometer tool, um, uh, it identifies that. Although uh, risk is still there, harm, harm is still there uh, and, and at an unacceptable rate uh, of over 6%. We also have across uh, the, uh, the organization um, a, a large group of people who support and help to safety expert groups uh, for children, medical specialties, surgical specialties, mental health, primary care and women's health. The work of the safety domain in NHS England would not exist without that group uh, with huge support from the colleges, associations and patients who represent uh, various elements. So what have we done since we've started? So we've launched the patient safety collaboratives, we've launched a new alerting system, uh, our new safety thermometers will be up and running from, uh, from this year. There is a fantastic opportunity to sign up for safety through a, a, a national approach to safety improvement. And we will be publishing uh, all our data on safety uh, through the NHS Choices website. Um, and uh, we will have also led a patient safety with the Godmark Work Service, uh, which again is a subject of another discussion. Uh, I think we certainly have been working hard on, on also raising uh, awareness uh, through many other groups. Uh, uh, that you see here, but I know that time is, is running short, so I now need to just start to close down. So in terms of outcomes data, where are we in terms of improvement? Um, and as we can see from here that incident reporting is increasing, and we should uh, fight hard to keep that close to our hearts, that we want more incidents reported. We want local commissions to understand that it, uh, incident reporting is a positive move in terms of a safety culture. We also need to recognize the fantastic uh, opportunity that was given by risk assessment processes in DTE, which now covers over 96 uh, of relevant patients admitted to hospital. Uh, and that is now starting to demonstrate a reduction in harm of death with DTE, both from small scale uh, studies, but also two large scale studies that uh, were published earlier. Uh, MRSA is, is down, C. diff is down. Uh, pressure ulcers show that a, a, a reduction in grades uh, two, uh, one and two, uh, but unfortunately not yet in grade four pressure ulcers. Uh, and this year coming up, we'll be launching our safety team, our safety improvement fellowship program. So I'm hoping that those on the call will, will want to participate in that. A new level of policy framework, uh, the implementation of the task force, uh, a review of the serious incident framework, and trying to trying to support primary care in reporting from general practice uh, to uh, the uh, national reporting and learning system. I'd like to finish with a quote from someone who I'd like and implore you all to read uh, at the work of Avelis Donabalian, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. That systems awareness and systems design are important for healthcare professionals, but they're not enough. They're enabling mechanisms only. It's the ethical dimensions of individuals that are essential to a system's success. And ultimately, the secret of quality is love. That's love for our patients, love for each other, our staff at the NHS, love for organizations, and most of all, love for our families. So, how do we replicate that and how do we prioritize that and see and change our behaviors and support cultural changes through the eyes of our patients? We must prioritize our patients in every decision we take. We must listen and learn. We must be evidence-based. We continue to strive to be open and transparent. Absolutely be inclusive of all in every sector and every setting. And we continually strive for improvement. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm sorry I've overrun and I'm sorry I might have 
rush through a few of the uh, uh, of the work that our crisis have led, but um, I'm sure we have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mike and That was a, that's a brilliant. Step. My next question is: um, How do I get involved in the Patient Safety Fellowship Program? Okay. Well, I think that's a, this is a really exciting opportunity for uh, to build uh, uh, our our response to the uh, across uh, England in terms of the capability, but it's also a huge opportunity for individuals. So what we're looking uh, to do is for organisations um, and individuals uh, to bring us bring themselves to our attention. Uh, we're co-producing this uh, this call. Uh, for fellowships by uh, with the Health Foundation, and we'll be publishing very soon on the Health Foundation website and the Entertainment website the exact process by which we want to, to do this. But we're aiming in the first instance uh, to look at a first cohort of probably up to 200 uh, uh, just after Christmas, so in those three or four months after Christmas. Uh, it's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, I think at five levels, I think the first is to really be. Uh, a great opportunity for individuals to support their organisation, uh, for individuals to support their local system. And this is where it ties very very well into the patient safety philosophy. So you know, become an immediate resource uh, and faculty uh, for a patient safety philosophy at the local level. At a third level, to be able to develop the communities of practice across England, we've identified lots of priority areas, and I think none more so uh, than those that are supported supported by groups of enabled clinicians getting together or not necessarily clinicians, all those who are interested in patient safety from a from every quarter, most importantly of course patients as well, to come together to the own communities of practice. The fourth level uh, I think would be to create a national academy, a national faculty uh, of our safety and uh, uh, which the Health Foundation I know are keen to to, uh, uh, to sponsor. And then the fourth fifth level will be to not just rely as much as we have on overseas support, but we start to offer uh, overseas support uh, in terms of safety and safety. Oh, that sounds amazing. Where, where would you place best place to find out more about this? Anything on the website? I think, I think uh, nothing will be on the website uh, and, and for, uh, for the next couple of months, but it will be on the website uh, and also on the Health Foundation website. Health Foundation has started to trail the press messages, so we will be up and running. Uh, we won't be able to run it fully as well. Another question is that somebody's asking about how they can get involved in the patient safety services and how, where's the best place to go to get involved? Okay, well, um, my rep, each of the 15 collaboratives, which there's a map, and you'll, you'll be reminded of the map when it comes out uh, with the, uh, uh, the materials, uh, there are 15 collaboratives of profit. They're all led by a safety lead uh, within, uh, sorry, each collaborative is led by, uh, within an AHSN, an academic health science network. Uh, these networks have a structure and a process, uh, and so that structure is uh, with a clinical chair um, and the chief executive officer. And there is a safety lead for each of the uh, collaboratives uh, within the AHSN. So what I would recommend is is that you go onto the local AHSN website for your uh, past potential uh, and then uh, identify who the safety lead would be and then contact with the email list directly. If that's too much of a burden, then please email me on the email address that was on the last one. And I will ensure that you are put in, put, uh, in touch with the relevant organization and individual. That's brilliant. That's decided to fill up the mic box and the mic box Um, This is an interesting question. Uh, I'm interested in the one you as well. Somebody mm -hmm. asked about the MRMS and the reporting system. Like, why are there so many uh, reporting reports from the acute side sector but not so many from the primary care? What's the reason for that? Well, that's a difficult question, really, and I always get in trouble when I answer it. Mm -hmm. Uh, from, particularly from my uh, general practice colleagues. Uh, so the, the, the fact is that we have uh, uh, 1.3 or so, 1.35 million uh, reports to the NRS 
us from many different sectors, the vast majority of the UK. We have a few thousands that come through the NLS from primary care settings. I think there are a number of reasons for this, and I think it's all really good. So I think there is a mitigation. I think one of the elements is the usability of the response form, of the reporting form. When a GP is, uh, or practitioner or, or staff member is, is busy having uh, timed visits, uh, very to, to fill in a clunky form takes time. Um, and uh, often in general practice, there isn't the, uh, there isn't the same time allowed for, uh, for reflection uh, after cases go through. So there's a bit, there's a bit of an issue there. So the, the whole time frame where safety sits within the cultural general practice is an issue. Uh, the time frame for doing that. But I think more and more it's the ease of access of reporting. So we are looking more and more at uh, relevant reforms, uh, relevant ways of making reporting easier for staff of general practices. Uh, I think in the acute sector, it's very it's expected and normal for all staff members to report. That's not necessarily the case in general practice, where often there's sort of a, a question mark about who is allowed to report. So I think we've got some cultural issues as well as some technical issues. Really. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, um, I think the question for me. <coughs> um, you mentioned just the best Eight-year-olds started to look at obesity and sugary drinks, 
and thus to uh, create measurement opportunities for how much water they would use. Then they would stop to distribute all of this. Uh, and not just on their weight chain, uh, but on a run rates on uh, how their sugary intake is brought forward. So, a very simple project with long term, huge long term impact, that led and delivered by children. So, if uh, by listening to our children in Chile, they come up with some very good, very good and important projects. So, I think my answer to you is, is a difficult one, but it's a we must listen to our patients and ask them what they believe is important in the improvement project. And start small. So start small because it's good, it will grow. It will grow by mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening.